Boris and I did a game a couple of weeks ago there and got a chance to s- sit down with Domas for a while. And the thing that impressed me, guys, it, one thing in the meeting and then one thing watching him courtside, which obviously I've done other Kings games as well, but it really struck me that night in a win against the Lakers where they swept the season series then, was everything in him, when he's talking about things, it always veers back to winning and being competitive and not not in a lip service way, in a that's the way he was raised to play basketball way. You know, and the way he could talk about the nuances of how his dribble handoff is different with Malik Monk versus the way it is with De'Aaron Fox versus the way it is with Keegan Murray and how he was able to break down those nuances just shows you his study habits, his passion for those nuances and getting every single ounce out of his game that he can. And then watching him that night and seeing his physicality, I mean, and I know I know there are times where he's still maybe a little too small depending on the matchup on the interior, but he is physical, man. And mm-hmm. you 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 feel him sitting courtside there. And I do wonder because of that skill set and the way he facilitates and I think since Jan 1st he's leading the league in total rebounds and total assists, which is very Jokic like. You know, I I do wonder if we aren't having enough curiosity because of the way he struggled in the playoffs last year in that matchup in the first round, if we're not having enough curiosity about what he can be for the Kings this year in the playoffs. Well, I think he's underestimated. And and I say that as somebody who's been guilty of that. Uh, Yeah. And the the lesson I learned there is if you're agreeing with bond temps, really (laughs) reconsider it because (laughs) – you know, w- listen. We were as critical as anybody uh, of the Kings you making too. that deal. You too. Yeah. yeah it, no. I. I mean, f- for once in your life, you were actually right. Uh, for once in my life, I didn't jinx stuff. somebody. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But obviously, the Pacers are ecstatic about that trade. They got Halliburton in the face of their franchise. But the Kings becoming a relevant NBA franchise again is in large part because of the impact that Demontis Sabonis is and. And uh, he is one of the most versatile. So Joker's the only other only other guy in the conversation in terms of the ability to score, rebound, assist. During this streak, this 50-plus game, uh, double-double streak, he had an eight-rebound game. He just had 13 assists that night. Yeah. And obviously, he's, he's, had a, he's had a ton of uh, triple-doubles during that span. And... You, know, you you mentioned the the physicality, and obviously you're not going to lead the league in rebounds if you're soft. You know you got to be you got to be tough. But dude, watch how he scores. You, you don't don't be full like just because he's not just dunking on guys. He creates space by being a fullback. I mean, he yeah. is getting his shoulder in there, and that's how he's getting off those little hooks. He is, I mean, he puts his shoulder in guys' sternums and creates space and bumps big guys back like a couple of feet on a regular basis. Yeah. So it's obviously a huge, well, that's probably one of the reasons why, just in general, the Kings, even though that was a skin tight series to the Warriors last year, the Kings have fought for, I think, some credibility ever since they got the three seed mm-hmm. and then went out in the first round. And, yeah, definitely. Um, but I will say, so this is a this is a big week. So the two times they've actually they are two and zero against the Mavericks this year. Um, yeah. I didn't go back and look. I have to assume at least one of those was when Kyrie was out, McMahon. I didn't go back. And uh, look I again. probably I I can tell you the first game. Uh, Live has obviously been great and should be an all rookie uh, selection. Uh, he's been great for the Mavericks. But the first game uh, that they played the Kings, Sabonis really you know, took lively to the woodshed. And and Sabonis is tough because we just talked about how physical he is, but he's also a guy who he grabs rebounds and and you know brings it up the floor, mm-hmm. pushes it in transition, you know, has has uh perimeter skills, especially as a ball handler. And that's something you're not seeing that as a seven foot guy who's a teenager. You're not seeing that on the AAU circuit or in the ACC. So it, it was a little bit different experience. Um, and then I actually looked, obviously Gafford starting for the Mavericks now, him and him and live there, a tag team. And I was like, Hmm, I wonder how Gafford fared against, uh, against Sabonis, you know, I, I wondered, had they seen each other this season? And they did, 
Uh, and Sabonis had a 28.13 rebound, 12 assist performance in a uh, in a Kings win. So, you know, we'll see how that goes. But obviously, if, if you're the Mavericks and you're going to win Sacramento, containing Sabonis is pretty high on the priority list. Yeah, so I have the box score here from the first meeting. And in fairness, this is in November. Yeah. So Derek Lively is still figuring out which direction the court is when he comes out of the visiting locker rooms, although this game was at home. Sabonis had 32, 13, and 6, and he was 13 of 15 from the field. He took two threes and missed. So that means he was 13 of 13 on twos. Yeah. Um, Lively had six points, nine rebounds. Kyrie did play in that game, but didn't play in the uh, second meeting. Both games were in Dallas. So as we speak here, which is Sunday night, the Kings actually uh, are in seventh. The the uh, Suns had a big win on uh, Saturday and uh, with all their guys uh, playing well. And so they've edged a half game ahead. Um, but this, this you know, the Kings era, uh, the, the Suns, as we've talked about, have a brutal schedule coming yes. down the stretch. Yeah, it's awful. And toughest look, in the league in terms of uh, opponents winning percentage. By the way, though, the Kings have the third toughest by opponents winning percentage. That's a good point. And so, um, although they have played much better against better teams, like the as Kings, long as they don't, yeah, as long as they don't yeah, have to play the Wizards again. Yeah, right. Well, I, yeah, they, it's, they, it's hard. They, to, you're, you're right, Ruko. It's hard yeah, to project the Kings. They've been all over the place. Yeah, they have. They, they're one of four teams to lose to the Wizards, Pistons, and Hornets this season. And yet they are also seven and three. That's hard to do when you only play them twice <laughs> in the Western yeah. Conference. You, yeah. don't, you don't get four bites yeah. at the apple. Yeah. yeah. And, and and yet they are seven and three against the Nuggets, T Wolves, and Thunder, the top that's three incredible. teams in the West. Yeah. Now that's a good stat, sir. Hats off. Hey, Hawkins would that's, never come to something like that. That's Matt Williams. That's Matt Williams <laughs> hooking me up. That's stats hooking there me up. Go. But but you know what's interesting, guys, is just, just to button up that point. Talking to them, I do think that has been sort of at the foundation of their confidence of why they can have success in these playoffs, you know, feeling like some of their struggles against lesser opponents during the regular season has been them learning how to handle posterity right after last season and then being encouraged by how they've been able to measure up to the best teams in the league. Yeah. And, and you know, going into this little uh, two-game set with the Mavericks. Uh, the Mavericks have been playing. It, it's weird. They had that stretch of five losses in six games. Outside of that, they've you know, they've been tearing it up. Yeah. Um, and I think because of the strength of the schedule, they, are, they do have the tiebreaker against uh, the Suns. They'll have to sweep the series and then have it come down a conference record if they were going to get the tiebreaker against the Kings. Sweep the, the two-game two set, game, I should yeah. say. Um, but I think if the Mavericks, I, yeah, more than the tiebreaker, I think just the opportunity to pick up two games in a, in a real tight race. I mean, well, I I'm just saying, just pure tiebreakers. But I think right. if they split, if the Mavericks split in Sacramento, I think they'd leave there feeling pretty good about their chances to uh, climb out Pass of the them. And, and claim uh, the the six seed. Especially since this first game is on the second night of a back to back, where the Kings are going to have two days off. Yeah, so. yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, and I, you know, um, I tell you, we, you talk about the Kings, you start with Sabonis and obviously De'Aaron Fox. They're, they're two guys, they weren't all stars this year, but they're absolutely all star caliber players. And then, you know, we'll get, you can talk about Keegan Murray, Malik Monk, six man of the year. You know who has become an absolute huge key for the Sacramento Kings? Keon Ellis. Yes. Yes. And a lot of people are listening right now going, who? A guy who was on a two-way deal, played himself into a, a standard contract. Kevin Herter's out now, as, as Wendy mentioned, with his shoulder. Uh, he's he's in the starting line. And you know what? If people know who Keon Ellis is outside of Sacramento, they probably are, oh, that's the guy who got fooled by Brunson pointed at a screen that wasn't coming and, <laughs> yeah, and got made to look that's silly. That's unfortunately been his biggest play yeah. highlight this year. But, dude, this guy, he has been playing, and he doesn't put up huge numbers. He had a great game against uh, Orlando. I think he had 19, a career-high 19. But he's been in the starting line. They're 8-1 and one this year with him in the starting lineup. That's kind of a wonky stat because it's over a couple different little spans. But – 
Uh, I think that he's going to have to continue to play really, really well, not necessarily score a lot, but like I assume he's probably going to, I assume Keegan Murray is probably going to be the primary defender on Luka and Keon Ellis will get Kyrie. So I, you know, that's a guy who, if the Kings are going to uh, come out of this mix atop the six to eight pile, I think he's going to be a big, big part of it, despite being a relative no name. Speaking of awards, um, I was noticing in some stats because uh, the De- De'Aaron Fox, who, by the way, had the two games that they, they played against the Mavs this year. He had big games both nights. I think he scored over 30 both nights. Um, obviously, he was the inaugural um, clutch player, uh, Jerry West Award last year. And there's kind of been a thought, well, he can't repeat. Um, but he had 12 points in the fourth quarter of that win over the Magic, which was a two-point win. And he has the most 10 plus point over 10 or more point fourth quarters in the NBA this season with 22. Um, you're the cojones factor analyst there, McMahon. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where you handicap, you know, he may not be having as good of a year as he was last year, but this is still a guy who in the end of a close game can get it done for you. Yeah. I think that if it's going to be a Californian, we're going to go in uh, San Francisco's West of Sacramento. I, right. I suck at you. South and West. Yeah. There you go. I think I think well, it would did be that Steph. really quickly. Yeah, I Brian think it'd be Steph Curry. Yeah, he he knows he's he's made yeah. that trip. Um, <laughs> if you ask me, who but you got to go south on I five. I mean that that's you know that's oh, key. There you go. If you ask me who the front runner is right now, it's going to be Demar Derozan. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It yeah, is well, interesting though because isn't I I think I think Fox is still leading the league in. Points per game in, in the fourth quarter, right? Points per fourth quarter. Yeah, fourth quarter sure. clutch. So yeah, yeah, clutch points. I have to look it up real quick to be hundred percent sure. But Curry had yeah. the lead lead last time I looked. Just yeah. clutch points, not fourth they've quarter. Been, and they've been in so many clutch yeah. games. The, the right. And the then uh, and same with same with the Bulls. They either get yep. blown out or it's down to the wire. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, Demar Derozan was right there. And then DeRo- like the the tighter you get, like. One possession game within three minutes, within one minute, yeah. last thirty yeah, seconds. Yeah, you can draw like the box. DeRozan, DeRozan ways, blows yeah. it away in all separates. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, yeah. I think hey, look, Darren Fox is obviously one of the best closers in the league. Um, I tell you what, though, Ruko could tell you, <laughs> Kyrie, <laughs> Kyrie and Luke aren't bad in those situations either. So, oh, no, they, well, they not. Th- that's the thing with last year, right? Last year when they first got there, they kept screwing up. They couldn't win a close game right and now 100 it's the opposite yeah and it was never it was never like a uh it, w- it wasn't like they were having a wrestling match for the ball yeah they were they were guilty of n- not want to step on each other's toes and deferring too much like the most memorable Kyrie luca moment from last season's you know failure that landed them in the lottery was when they're passing the ball back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, game on the line against the Wolves until they cough it up and it's a, and it's a turnover. Mm-hmm. Where this year, they they both had a uh, they both had great clutch numbers. They're playing off of each other. The the chemistry and the chemistry from a personal standpoint had n- it was never an issue. Just kind of learning how to play off each other. You know that's taken off this year, and they've been surrounded by better fits. Um, you know they they don't have Christian Wood uh, closing games with them. I, yeah. You know, they, so it's always a it, special moment when Chris Wood gets mentioned by McMahon on this podcast. Right <laughs> I'm glad I was here to witness it. I, you know, it's they're they're good. You know, we talk a lot about scary teams and 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 the West and. And of course, so much of that focus has been on the Lakers and Warriors. And if they emerge, of all those teams, Dallas is the one that if I was one of those top teams in the West, I would be very concerned with. And, you know, the main reason, obviously, is because Luka is a bad man. And, yeah. and, and then Kyrie, as we all know, when he's able to slot into really being your shooting guard, that is when he is at his best. And we saw it in the 2021 season with Harden. Kyrie had an unbelievable year, 50-40-90. If Giannis doesn't slide under his ankle in the conference finals, he and KD are probably getting the Nets to, I mean, in the Eastern Conference semis, they're probably getting the Nets to the conference finals, even with Harden hurt. 
Uh, that's how good he had been throughout that season. But when you slot him off, off the ball like that, he's mm-hmm. just he's just so so good and dynamic and efficient. And we've seen that throughout. Plus, we know he has no fear taking any kind of big shot. And then, you know, you look at a couple things with Dallas. One, the way they've been getting easy baskets. First of all, one thing that I marvel at any time I, I watch Luka is just how easily he scores. Because everybody's always kind of in between. Is he going to pass? Is he not going to pass? Oh, wait, he's just going to lay it in. And, and he just gets easy buckets. The numbers, though, since Feb 10th, since they made those trades, it's crazy. They went from, I think... 26th or 28th in layups and dunks per game to 7th, and they're, yeah. they're shooting those shots that more efficient than anybody. And then you look at some of their lineup combos, their starting lineup, you know, they're starting five since Jones moved in uh, with with Washington Gafford, Kyrie, and Luka. They're absolutely bludgeoning teams over 80 minutes. I think they're like a net 28. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.